afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is an opportunity for us all to come together to be inspired by one of our Hall of Fame's inaugural inductees, Mr. Terry Vandertuck. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce Terry and give you a little bit of, back, of his background. Terry's exposure to, be, to business began very early in his, in his life. As a boy, he observed his father in business and recognized his deep determination. Today, Terry will credit his father for his own focus and determination. In 1963, Terry graduated from Michigan State University and then served three years as an officer in the Navy. He went on to graduate from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School in 1968 with an MBA. Equipped and ac with academic and practical business e experience, he moved into careers in consulting, sales, and executive management. All the while, he searched for opportunities to put his, school, to put his skills to work at an entrepreneurial level. He found, it, he found that opportunity in 1978. Terry purchased Graphic Technology, Inc., GTI. It was then a failing, fledging barcode manufacturer. But what he saw was something in GTI and he managed to turn the company around in a very short order. Following several years of dramatic growth of over 50% per year, he took GTI public on the American Stock Exchange in 1983. In 1988, Forbes ranked GTI as the best small growth company in America. And in 1989, Nito Dinko Corporation purchased GTI where Terry remained active as chairman for 11 years. Now Terry is president of Van Can Inc., a Kansas-based venture capital firm which invests in privately held companies in the Midwest area. He has, several, he has served on several educational boards, including the Warden School, and currently serves on the boards of several privately held companies. If you have visited the, hall of, the Entrepreneur Hall of Fame in, the, in this building on the southwest corner, you likely saw Terry's favorite quote on the touch screen, good enough is never good enough. With that, I ask you to please help me in giving a warm welcome for Entrepreneur Hall of Fame inaugural inductee, Terry Vandertuck. Terry, we're glad to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Now can everybody hear me? Yes. Well, I'm going to repeat a, a bit of what was already talked about. Um, and maybe add a little bit of color to it. Before GTI, well before GTI, at the ripe old age of 10, I started my first venture and by the age of 13, had three of them under my belt. I had a paper drive, I collected hangers and sold them to a local dry cleaner, and also collected newspaper and sold it to the local storage and moving company. I did this partly because of my dad. Um, my dad was an, a closet entrepreneur, 
He had a, a regular business. He had a regular job with a regular company. And over the years, attempted to start two or three companies. They were never really very successful because he really didn't focus on them enough because he had his normal job that he had to take care of. So anyway, later, when I went to Michigan State, graduated from there, my father suggested that I join the Navy and see the world, so to speak. Um, I became an officer in the Navy, and at the ripe old age of 22, had 40 civilians working for me in Trinidad. Not a bad place to work for a couple of years. After that, as has already been said, I attended the Wharton School and got an MBA in, in 1968. Following that, I spent two or three years with a management consulting firm. And following that, I was assistant to the president of Alice Chalmers for three or four years. After that experience, I decided it was time to get my hands really dirty. And that's the sort of title of this spiel, getting your hands dirty. But telling other people what to do without really knowing what they did or without having their own skin in the game is not the same. So I moved from Milwaukee here to Kansas City and became chief, finance, chief financial officer of a company by the name of Select Brands. Now Select Brands at the time was a company growing at roughly 40% per year and it did that for the five years I was with them. You either learn quickly or you die, so to speak. But in this particular case, I had to quickly learn how to manage banking relationships since we had to change banks every once in a while. Why? As you will learn later, because we were growing too fast. And banks don't like that when you grow too fast. Secondly, I had a number of people working for me who I finally ended up having them work as a team rather than as individual departments. So as an example, one of the things that we always had a big problem with were inventories. Wholesale distributorships live and die on whether the inventories are correct. So every 90 days like clockwork, you had to take inventory. And then for about the next 45 days, check that inventory to make sure it was correct. And by the time you checked it and corrected it, it was time to take inventory again. So this was one of the pain in the rears of being in the wholesale distribution business. After five years, Barrett Hellsberg came to me, who was the owner of Hellsberg Diamonds, and asked me to be VP of Finance for that company. Again, time to get your hands dirty. I did so, and again, was responsible for the normal stuff, the banking relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And after about a couple of years, a friend of mine came to me who was in the venture capital business. Now, I had met Larry some six years previous at Select Brands, as a matter of fact. And he said, well, I have this opportunity slash risk for you if you're interested in it. At the time, I was 37 years old and had all my life wanted to have my own company, but really never found the right opportunity. So he described graphic technology to me as this little company that was within a week or two of bankruptcy whose business was creating pressure-sensitive barcode labels that go on grocery shelves. Everybody has seen those, barcode, price, et cetera. At the time, this was a very, very new product. And the associated stuff that you had to have with it 
in order to have a fully integrated system didn't exist. So these guys, before I got involved, sat in their offices waiting for the orders to arrive, and the orders never arrived. So I ended up spending the, the princely sum of 25 grand to buy the company, to which you say, that's unbelievable. How do you buy a company for 25 grand? Well, that's not the whole story. The rest of the story is that at that time, the company had a negative net, negative net worth of about 600 grand, and the bank, in their inimitable fashion, suggested that I sign a piece of paper or I couldn't take the business over that amounted to a personal guarantee. That had I been able, had I, if I would have had to cough it up, there is no way in God's green earth I could have paid them the half million dollars. So, but I learned something about banks at the same time. Banks know full well that if you're an upstanding person, the last thing you want to lose is your reputation. So that personal guarantee is backed really by your reputation more than anything. But I stepped into the, stepped into the fire, and after about 30 days, whoops, number two happens. I'm waiting for cash to come in from the receivables only to find that about 25% of the receivables are not real. Now here I'm this finance guy with an MBA from the Lorton School. How in God's name could that happen? The story is simple. They run audited financial statements, and I trust everybody. Later I learned to trust everybody and then count the cards. Um, so anyway, after this experience of having cash flow be a problem, I figured the only way that we would solve the problem of getting more sales is to go beat the bushes ourselves. So I hired two great salespeople who incidentally I couldn't afford at the time, but was able to fund them by not paying myself, which I didn't do for nine months. So anybody that tells you this is easy is crazy. Um, I also learned that it's a lot easier to grow sales than it is to cut costs. There are all these people talk about, well, you're going to fix a business, and the first thing you do is you cut costs. That is an extremely difficult thing to do, and it's a whole bunch easier to grow the sales. So that's what we did. In the meantime, I, I was the guy carrying all the hats. And what I mean by that is that I was responsible for production. I was responsible for finance. I was responsible for the bank accounts, purchasing the whole nine yards. On the positive side, that's a really good feeling to have, you know, you run everything. Isn't that just super? The problem with running everything is that there are not enough hours in the day. And for the first year or so, I ended up working six days a week, 12 hours a day, blah, 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 but I did. Um, eventually, having to let loose of some of those hats, which is the hardest thing in the world to do, but it's the only way you can really effectively grow a company. The second thing, the third thing that happened is that sales started to come in and we started to make a little bit of money, but we weren't growing at the rate that I really wanted to grow the company. So thinking, trying to think outside the box, remember what I said about select brands, Hellsburg, and in fact, even my Navy experience, the business about the inventories. So that clicked in and I thought about, at the time, two huge potential customers 
that had absolutely nothing to do with the grocery industry with whom we were doing some business. Those two companies were Kmart and Walmart. So what do I know? So I put on a suit and tie and went to visit both companies. And magically, within a period of about 60 days, we were doing test orders for both companies. For what purpose? Figure out what their inventory problems were. The barcodes that we have today are pretty well established barcodes. Back then, we created barcodes with specific uh, formats for these two firms that were different than anybody else's. Anyway, they became the springboard for growing the company, as was said, some 50% a year, six years in a row, which is not an easy thing to do. But it was a lot of fun, I have to tell you. Um, so at the same time, we, in three of those five years, we were one of the Inc. 500 fastest growing companies in the country. That led to a fair number of conversations with some investment bankers about whether or not we wanted to take the company public. Well, it seemed appropriate at the time because we were in the process of, of planning out a new manufacturing facility and moving the business. So one thing led to another, and we ended up taking the company public in 1983. And that was one of the things that I'm really proud of as it relates to GTI. Um, and at the time, it was everybody's dream to take their company public. Maybe not so much today. But let me tell you, it really worked out well. Um, so for the next five years, we were a public company, and I ended up spending probably about 25% of my time on investor relations. Another 25% of the time, what I call managing by walking around. I spent very little time in my office, but instead would walk out on the production floor, go out with salespeople to, find, to make sure that I was grounded in what was really going on. Because those production people, as an example, many times had great ideas for how to improve things, but because they had to go to their supervisors and then they had to go to their supervisors, they ended up I never got many of those ideas. And it was also good for me because by talking to them and getting their ideas, they felt more a part of the team, which at the end of the day, as all of you know, is the whole deal. You don't have people working for you, they're a team, and they will do what you, what you ask them to do as long as you roll up your sleeves and are part of it. So anyway, after about five years, I realized that I was spending more time worrying about the next 90 days quarterly release than I was the long-term health of the company. So I figured it's time to sell a company. So about it took about three or four months, but it was already public. So I sold the company to a Japanese firm in 1988 and spent the next 10 years as chairman of the company. In 2000, I left GTI and formed an AMCAN, which I now still run. The AMCAN is part of the my effort to try to give back a little bit. Um, about that same time, I helped form the Entrepreneurial Center of Johnson County. Uh, I was one of the founders of the Silicon Prairie Technology Association, and also joined the, the Wharton Entrepreneurship Board. VanCan primarily invests in startups and some mezzanine financing for companies already 
in the middle stages of, of growing. So what do I look for? It seemed to me that, it, and Beverly suggested, that one of the things that you all might be interested in is what I look for when I'm talking to the budding entrepreneurs. I think the most important thing I look for is passion. Whether somebody is just doing this for the hell of it, or they really care about what it is they want to do. Getting past that, have they done the homework necessary? And by homework, I don't mean a 200-page business plan. I mean a relatively simple seven or eight-page document that talks about what the idea is, what the growth plan is, who's going to do what, and a few numbers. Those are really the critical things. Um, I will also say that, at least based on my experience with my dad, as you remember what I said, you can't really be a real entrepreneur unless you're willing to put your neck on the line. As you heard, I did. And what that means is that it's very hard to start a new venture part-time. In my case, I had saved some money, so things worked out pretty well so that I could not pay myself for nine months and still eat and still eat. So those are the things that I look for. So in sort of summary, there's no such thing, in my view, of trying to be an entrepreneur part-time. You either do it or you don't do it. And if you do it, you find out risk is real. The probability of success is nowhere near 100%. But if you care enough and your idea is good enough, you will succeed, even though it might be damn tough in the first part of it. But secondly, as I said, passion's really important, particularly as viewed by the people that work with you. If they can't see your excitement, then they can't get excited and, and will be just, quote, employees, and just quote, employees, doesn't work for a new business. Finally, the getting rid of the hats business is really important. And I'll give you an added, to think, think about it this way. If you're a doctor, the only thing you can do is sell 24 hours a day. That's all you got. The advantage of having a company and not selling hours, but rather selling expertise, means that you as the owner can help your people do their jobs, but get rid of some of those hats in the process so you can spend more time growing the company faster. And in the end, that's the best ride in the world. With that, let me open it up for some questions that I'll try to answer. All right, so we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes, so if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I'll try and run over there and sort of relay the questions so we can all hear them. Um, First of all, before we get started, and I, I take questions from the crowd, um, as was mentioned earlier, that you have a quote that sort of graces our, our Entrepreneur Hall of Fame that's, uh, good enough is never good enough. Um, can you elaborate on that and, and sort of let us know where that, that saying came from? Originally, one of the ways that I was able to get some free advertising for the company 
is that each year I wrote something called GTI Laws. And these were a compilation of you know, one-liners, basically, that I would pick up from books, or write myself, or just hear from other people. And they were really valuable because the people that I called on in companies were typically the presidents or the VPs of finance. So I would print these GTI laws up on, on beautiful um, paper or other kinds of material. And these people really appreciated them because they were sort of funny and yet they, they had a lot of, they were very concrete sort of truths. So when my competitors went in there and lavished them with gifts, et cetera, it always irritated them because these darn laws were hanging up on their wall, believe it or not. But it worked. Um, the good enough is never good enough relates specifically to, again, your people. If they're allowed to do a half a job, your salesmen are selling a half a job. And nobody can be proud of that. You've got to give a damn about your products and make them the best possible you can. That's why good enough is never good enough. I'm sure a lot of the companies you invest in probably hear that plenty from you. <laughs> um, any questions from the crowd? Oh. Coming on over. Sir, so uh, you mentioned that um, you really have to give up a lot of hats um, when you want to grow a company. So I'd like to ask, what were the most difficult, most important hats that you had to give up? And were one of those um, a technical side kind of hat? because usually the CEOs are not the people who have big, deep technical uh, knowledge, but that would be the CTO. So yeah, maybe uh, you can help us elaborate on that. Thank you. It, it really depends on the type of company, but as president of the company, and, they, and it's very hard to describe. You really don't want to give up any hats. Because it's kind of fun being sort of the controller of all the strings. But as I, I said, you've got to because otherwise you can't grow. I would say in my particular case, the hardest hat for me to give up and yet probably the most important was the hat involving marketing and sales. One of the things I didn't say, that reminds me, that I didn't say that I wanted to say was that regardless of whether you have a technical background or a non-technical background, or you're an accountant, or you're, you know, you're a production type, it doesn't make any difference. At the end of the day, as the individual starting the business, you will be a salesperson. Because if you can't sell your ideas, maybe you can't sell your product, although you ought to be able to. But you've got to be able to sell your ideas to your own people. If you can't crank your people up to do a better job, you're going to be dead in the water. Please remember that. If, if you don't take away anything else from this get-together, take that away, because it's really important. And you'd be surprised how big you can be if you have to at selling. All right, we, we've got another one right back over here again. Uh, one of the things I've seen among, among business leaders that are usually prolific readers, what in your opinion is the most impactful book on leadership uh, that you read during your career, and what are you currently reading? <laughs> hmm. Well, let me start with the, the easier question. Um, 
two books that I'm reading right now. One of them is called 10% Happier. And 10% Happier is a book on meditation. Well, I've never done that. I thought it'd be interesting to try it. The other book, which I got yesterday, is uh, entitled The Patient Will See You Now. And it is a book about um, the medical industry, the medical business, doctors and dentists, and how that business is going to change over the next 10 years. In terms of, boy, thinking back about the questions about, I, I read a lot while I was in, well, as president of GTI, and, uh, oh God, what was his name? Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker's book on, on leadership and management was probably the sort of textbook at the time. Um, but as I said, I, I read a lot of books that were timely, and I would use those to try to pass on stuff to my people at the same time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, we got one here. Should probably have moved to the middle already. All right, here we go. Uh, two things. You said that the, public, the company going public was something that was very great for you to that happened. I want you to explain that. And the other thing is that you said you sold the company to someone in Japan. And my question is, how do you get foreign investors in, invested into your company? Is that automatic, or do you reach out to them? You mean when I went public? Do, well, that too, and also when you sold your company, the, the GTI, when you sold that. Okay, well, technically the company was public, so selling it meant selling the shares I owned as well as everybody else's shares, which meant I had to get their okay to do that. That was a little tricky, but you know they got a 30% bump up to sell it, so you know that's a pretty good reason to sell it. Um, <laughs> the in terms of the going public part of it, um, as I as it says somewhere here, I think in the Hall of Fame stuff. Um, the probability of being able to take a company public is less than one in a hundred thousand. It's a hard thing to do, but boy, was it worth it. <laughs> um, and it's something that you know I, I always had wanted to do, um, and did it for I think the right reasons. Um, at the time, the company was doing pretty well, so it wasn't a question of, of needing, you know, needing to pad my own pockets or anything, not at all. But. And did you, did, did you reach out to companies, or what, what was that buying process like, or the selling process for you, I suppose? You mean the, the selling to the Japanese? Yeah. That, that was almost as interesting as taking the company public to begin with. Because you end up, um, investment bankers create mirages, I guess you'd call it, where company A, you have three other companies you're bidding against, and blah, 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 blah. And then it's two companies, and then it's the company. And when it's the company, it became, becomes a very delicate dance, because you're talking about a lot of money. And, um, but it's something that, you know, it's not like riding a bike. I mean, it's not something you learn. It, you, you become part of it, that's all. And, uh, and hope for the best. Very good, thank you. And uh, nicely enough, our questions are coming in pairs, so we have one more back here. I just had a question. You had mentioned that um, you had some difficulty working with banks when you were growing quickly. Um, just wondered if you had any wisdom for any new businesses in dealing with finance companies and banks to be able to kind of bring the bank along to their point of view and see the vision with them, kind of that kind of. 
Well, there are a few blunt truths. <laughs> One of them is that, God, I hope there are no bankers in the room. <laughs> they, at the end of the day, the, the only thing the banks are interested in is the personal guarantee that you have twice as many assets as you need a loan for, et cetera. So how do you get around that? Because I had to get around that. So I spent a lot of time with the banks talking about the future and selling them on the fact that the business plan would be overachieved every year. So rule number one, if you provide a business plan, which they're going to want, give them a short-term business plan that you can beat the socks off. Okay? Secondly, try to get a couple of banks involved because they hate competition. Thirdly, as I said, I changed banks several times with both select brands as well as GPI. But in every single case, it wasn't because we lacked money or anything. It was because we were growing too fast. Banks are pretty conservative with a lot of people. So keep that in mind. All right, got one down here. Uh-oh, this guy used to work for me. <laughs> A real story. <laughs> Gary, you talk about passion, and I teach young entrepreneurs, and one of the truths that we hear lots of times is don't fall in love with your product. So when you speak of passion, are you talking passionate of the ownership of business, passionate of the product, passionate of the industry, or some combination of all? Whew. <laughs> It's, Terry, I want to work for you. There's nothing exciting about sticky labels. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just so you know, when the headhunter called me and said, would you like to sell sticky labels, and I was selling computers, I'm like, I have a college education. I don't need to sell envelopes. <laughs> um, but it turned out very well, by the way. I guess the passion I'm talking about is one's view of what the company is, and more importantly, what it will be, regardless of the product. Because if you can't, in my opinion anyway, you've got to be proud of your company. Because if you aren't, how can, anybody, how can anyone else be proud of it? And being proud of the company is part of the engine that gets that growth going. Everybody wants to be a part of a winning company. And the definition of winning is growing. Any other ex-employees want to ask some questions? <laughs> it's probably your last chance for a while. All right. Uh, yep. Hi. Um, as a VC investor, what is your best investment so far? And also, what is your worst investment? And then what did you learn from it? Hmm. Well, one of the best investments was actually the first investment, where I lent a company in Wichita um, $400,000, I think it was. And this was about 15 years ago. And was getting 12% interest, blah, 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 blah. They paid me back the half million dollars, but as part of the deal, I had what's called a carried interest, carried interest. So along after they paid me back, they gave me, uh, I think it was a 3% interest in the company. And five years after that, I exchanged that 3% of the company for a million three. That's okay. It's particularly good when you don't have any money invested in it. So that's the best one. The worst one? Well, one of them was a venture involving um, a gal that was going to um, 
bring students in from China to here at NKC as well as some other schools. And that fell on its face in part because part of the custom was to give a lot of expensive gifts to get the local politicians, et cetera. And I wouldn't do that. And that screwed up the whole process. So it wasn't a huge investment, but it bruised my ego because I don't like to lose. Um, so that's one. There was, because there have been several that didn't work out. I mean, that's part of the deal. You probably, out of 10 investments, you'll lose 100% on three of them, maybe even four. And look for one out of 10 to really be home runs. So, but I like to talk about my losses anyway. <laughs> Nobody does. Any other questions? So we've got time for maybe one more. Here we go. Um, as an entrepreneur, um, the mindset is obviously extraordinary compared to the mind of a regular person. What is one habit that you have developed um, in your day-to-day -day activities that you believe is crucial to any success for any entrepreneur and has definitely been um, proven a success for you in your experiences, like one daily habit that you've picked up ritually? Probably work ethic more than anything that you do what it takes to get things done um, every day. Because I can't make it any simpler than that. And I believe that. I really do. Because, I mean, why not give it all you got? You know, I want a life to live. You may as well make it as great as you can make it. And study hard and work hard in your classes, all right? <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, uh, we're just about out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, sir.